what can I say about Kamal Ravikant? He is today's modern day philosopher god king. He has helped millions of people around the world and he's helped me as well, as you'll find out. He is as brilliant as they come. He is a wonderful writer who works hard and studies the craft of writing. He is a philosopher, and the most important lesson I think I will take away, and you will take away from this conversation, is how deep the mind can go, especially when it's fueled with the self confidence that can only come with a form of self love, as Kamal describes so eloquently, so beautifully. Uh, that it's almost irresistible and impossible to not be moved by him, his personal story. He is a legend, a young a legend, and I am uh, so pleased that he spent the time with me that he did. And you'll see he called it his favorite podcast ever. Um, and uh, I'm going to put that on my CV because that's one of the coolest things that someone like me can hear who studies not but the scientific literature and not very often the self-help literature. But Kamal uh, has really been a force for good in my life. And I know he will be in yours too. So sit back and enjoy this episode with none other than Kamal Ravikant. How to love yourself like your life depended on it. Enjoy. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The way I want to start off our podcast today is, is actually with the end of Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. Uh, and and I think the thing that resonated most to me as a scientist is actually the in the in the concluding chapter. I don't know. I don't know how you got away with like more chapters than the Bible, but somehow there's like 90 chapters in it. And uh, it's short. It's, I, mean, I know there's, there's no super slavery. Sharp. There's no slavery. No one's being sacrificed, man. Like, <laughs> but 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 all that you know, all that stuff about shellfish and not eating, you know. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's no bacon. There's no bacon in this book. Uh, but the no end of the book was... by uh, my guest today, Kamal Ravikant, uh, ends with share what you learn from this. Take it away and oh, share yeah, it. Yeah. And it's yeah, not yeah. based upon like some craven venal desire to sell more. But I don't think anyone writes a book like this, uh, Kamal, to make a lot of money. It's it's the experience in it. It's the opposite, yeah. Other people. It's like, you know, a Bible commentary. Like nobody writes a Bible commentary to make a lot of money. And I feel like this book, it's a self-help book. But that notion at the very end is where I want to begin this conversation with you in that um, – I think that you're a scientist. I know that you started off as a research scientist. You thought about going to medical school. You know, I think you might be part Jewish because that's that's the way. You know, all Jewish kids start off. They have to go to medical school to, to, or law school. You know, if they if they really fail, they could become an accountant, I suppose, but not a scientist. But you started off in science, and that's what you wanted to do. And I want to ask you: the word scientist in the Russian language means someone who was taught. It probably means like a dude who was taught, but let's just say someone who was taught. Now to me, interesting. That, that provides an insight into the nature of science itself, which is that I was taught, Brian Keating as a scientist, that means I have an obligation to teach. I wanna ask you, do you see yourself as a scientist and what do you think about this obligation of teaching that I see you as a master communicator being one of the most foremost explicators thereof? So. As a scientist or, or you know, science adjacent, what do you think is the responsibility of someone with the tools, with the experience, with the mentality that you have to share with the world? You know, that's so interesting using that word. I've never used that word to describe myself, but I was funny enough that you mentioned this today, like in Kamal land, I mean, in Kamal's head, there's a lot of activity that happens and try to figure out life. Always, I'm just trying to deconstruct life. And if you think of my books, those are just like snapshots and moments of what I deconstruct about life at that time. And when I say life, I mean the human self experience of life and how to create a better experience of that human self. And, and, and I was thinking like, look, originally, like, you know, if you look at the cell or if you look at the distant nature of evolution, it was to, to pass on to the next. It was always mm -hmm. to pass on. What did you pass on? You passed on DNA. It was always, and what is DNA? DNA is information. DNA is literally information that, that DNA by itself does nothing. It is just the code you're passing on. You're passing on your specific code, right? That's all it was. Evolution was passing on. The entire reason for existence was passing along your code to then further, further, and down. We are the result of code that was passed on for whatever, how many millions of years, or if you're biblical, how many thousands of years, you know, wherever, whatever rabbit hole you want to go down. And, but then... 
But then at the same time, there's not just the code of, of survival of the code of the physical building block. There is the, there is the code, uh, the meme code, the knowledge code. Like, look, I was, I was actually, I Googled this today. Funny enough, you mentioned this because I was, I just wanted to make sure in my head, you know, like uh, Newton and Newton and cal calculus, right? I just want to make sure, you know, I just come out, make sure you, you're, you're correct on this. It turns out there was another person who came up, another mathematician, I think, who came up with the calculus yeah, separately. Yeah, Leibniz. Yeah, Leibniz. Right? Yeah. And they were so, rivals. Yeah, they hated each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's like, look, they passed down a, a code. They passed down their knowledge. Just like if we were like, it's always DNA being passed on, which is just coded knowledge. Now it's almost like a responsibility of us as humans that what we learn, we pass that along. So it goes, it flows down and causes ripple across humanity for, for till, till the end of time. Um, because you existed, you were here. What was the extra set of knowledge you cured that you're passing along? It mm. can be just your genes or it can be like the experience, the lessons, right? Absolutely. And so that's what my books are. That's literally snapshots in Kamal's mind and life, what he's figured out and sharing it. It's so funny that you say that because Carl Sagan, so I've got all these finger puppets. I'm working on a Kamal Ravikant uh, puppet, but this is- Oh my God, know, that'd be awesome. I don't know if you recognize this guy. This is Carl Sagan. <clears throat> Carl Sagan was one of the foremost uh, explainers of science in the popular world. And, and he was actually- reviled by proper scientists for being too good at explaining things. I actually had his widow and his daughter on the Into the Impossible podcast last year, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, put links to that in the show notes perhaps later on. But, but my favorite quote from Carl Sagan was, uh, a book is proof that human beings can work magic because a mm. book is written by someone who may or may not be with us, centuries old, and that book makes you have the author's voice in your head. It's as close to magic as humans are capable of. So now I say, you know, and I'm sure this is true of the Curious Kamal podcast, but I say a podcast is proof that human beings can work magic. Look at this. We're we're separated oh. by hundreds of miles, you know, time and space. We're having an instantaneous conversation at the speed of light that will be shared with people around the world potentially. And uh, and here we are. And here are your ideas preserved with your voice, with your image, uh, and and for all time. And I think it's 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 part of who we are is the DNA of a human being that we are the only species that's capable of, of doing such a thing, of passing on our legacy in addition to our genes in terms of our memes and our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, look, what if, uh, you know, um, Newton hadn't passed on calculus? He came that's up right. with it, great, good for me. Good for <laughs> me, I figured it out. And then, you know, went to his grave. What if Einstein did the same, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't do he goes up to his grave. Good for me, I figured it out. What if that's all it was? You know, good for me. I figured it out. Right. Like humanity would be, we would still be banging on caves and bones, you know? Mm. And in I some ways we are. But <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the, you know, we have more sophisticated bones. Our bones have yeah. 5G, have yeah. 5G in it, but uh, we still stare at, you know, pieces of rock, silicon and, and glass. <laughs> You know, we're not that far removed, but I want to start also in the in the book. The number, there's a lot of numbers in this book, a lot of numerology, and and you and I are engaged in a in a uh, an interesting project to to have you uh, come up to speed on quantum mechanics. And I'm doing that selfishly, Kamal. I have to admit that in front of my yeah. audience because I'm interested in knowing what the mind of Kamal Ravikant will bring to a subject that is esoteric, that is uh, arcane, but is incredibly important, not only for its practical applications, but for the way it'll change your mind. And I am so curious, as I did with our mutual friend, James Altucher, who put us both in touch in some sense or one mm -hmm. another, has influenced each one of us to write a book. I, I know that. that. I want to get that, into man. that. I love him too. And, uh, and I want to say, you know, one of his ideas that I've been working on with him is teaching him about the Big Bang. And I learned so much oh. from him about his ideas and he has, uh, and I'm just hoping that you and I can have a taste of that as well. But let's start with James Altucher as a friend of the show um, and the numerology of this book. You basically have given him so much credit and you mentioned him in the book uh, as inspiring you to put this on paper, not, not just for you, but for the whole world. What, what do you feel like when you write a book like this that has impacted millions of people around the world. Is that a burden to you? Do you feel a pressure to live up to this expectation or do you just get on with life as if it never happened? You know, it's, it's very interesting because I get emails every day, right, from readers and they're just heartwarming, heartbreaking and the effect this book is having, you know, like 
Like, uh, uh, and I can tell what, what it's come out of a different language, different country, because I start getting emails from that country. The latest has been Russia. I'm getting all these emails from these wonderful Russians, right? That from like these places in Russia, I have to Google and see where it is, you know, <laughs> like it's a big country. And, 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 it, and, but the thing is, I take it in, I respond, you know, sometimes I fall months behind, but I usually catch up with, and I always respond with apologies for being late and I respond. And it's beautiful. It's heartwarming. But then I move on to Kamal land, you know, which is just, what is this whole show about? Why am I here? What am I doing? You know, like the whole thing. It's very hard to walk around just feeling the, I don't, I feel the responsibility when I'm writing and the responsibility is not to any audience. It's not to any human being. You know, when I wrote that original version of Love Yourself, I didn't expect it to take off like that. I literally, I set out to be, I trained myself to be a, to be a, a fiction writer. You know, I wanted to write literary fiction. I wanted to write the kind of fiction that some day professors taught in, in college, you know, like that level of fiction, right? And yet I ended up writing this little self-help book, right? I didn't expect it to take off. It was just purely to share something I'd learned that was very important. And I'd made a commitment to my friend and I keep my commitments. It's just, you know, the classic, you're a man, your word is your bond, be a man. <laughs> literally, I, I'm speaking because I'm a man, but I can say as a human being. Yeah, of course. Your word is your bond, keep your word, right? Mm. And and so it's just something I really firmly believe in. It's become one of my cornerstones of, of who I am. And so I did it. But so there was no expectation it was going to go take off or be this big or whatever, right? Or even the second version, which I put out, which was like, okay, let me seven years later really share all the nuggets I've learned over time and answer the questions that have come up. It, it's, it's what it is, is it's the commitment to the work. It's like, I have to make this work as precise and as honest as I as I am capable as a human as myself at this point in time, and I do that obsessively, word by word, draft by draft. I mean, like if you read earlier drafts, I mean they're garbage, but I let my mind throw garbage on the page that I can then hammer and chisel, start hammering and chiseling. Um, so it's a commitment to the work, commitment to what I'm putting out. It's actually a commitment to the book, not you know, and which in itself is a commitment to the reader. But you, if you start doing doing something for the reader. I didn't know that I would have 16 year old girls in Russia reading this book, you know, or like veterans or like this grand grandmothers emailing from England or like this other places. And people tell me about the, you know, like the stop them committing suicide. You know, the first ever reader I actually had was it who emailed me was an Israeli guy who said like the book stopped it from killing itself. So I immediately email like, dude, here's my number, call me. Like, you know, like, <laughs> and we met years later in New York City, we were hugging each other. Like, I didn't expect something. <laughs> like, I, I've never been to Israel. I don't have that, that life experience he has. So what I did was I had a commitment to telling the truth, mm. my truth mm. of what I had learned. So that level of con commitment to, uh, to also deconstruct it, to deconstruct it in a way that, that I can wordsmith and get across that anyone can then apply. Mm. You know, so if that's that commitment that I, I feel immense pressure towards, but I don't feel pressure towards how it's going to go out and what it's going to do. Does that make but sense? Yeah, what I love about it is that it's not <clears throat> it's not pure theory. It's not only philosophy. There is a lot of philosophy in it, but it's very practical. It actually outlines as you know, I'm a pilot, and one of the things pilots take very seriously are checklists. So we have a checklist, and there's a saying that you know, uh, you you can't. There are no old pilots. There are old pilots, and there are bold pilots, but there are no old <laughs> bold pilots. And I think that's a, it. You had on Curious Kamal. You had a fighter jet pilot. I, I'm sure he's not bold, and I'm sure he doesn't rely yeah. on raw skill and like hand-eye coordination you know, because by then it's too late. So you rely on your process, on your procedures, on your training, and on your checklist. I see this book as a checklist checklist as a, and as a manifesto uh, for achieving happiness. But before we move into the book, I still want to talk just one last thing about, uh, you know, I don't know you very well, but I can't imagine the burden. Uh, I, I get a burden. I, I get emails, you know, once a month, you know, from someone in Egypt, like here's some Jewish guy, you know, from New York City, and I'm getting an email from a devout Muslim girl from Egypt, and she loved uh -huh. my book, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's awesome. awesome. But I, it, it's about like, you know, physics, and she has a cosmo, but it's not like I'm going to kill myself. And and I do talk about suicide in my book, but, but the but how, it just seems like this immense burden. And, and I know that you're a giving gracious soul, but there's a saying, as you know, from piloting, you know, being on planes, you got to put your oxygen mask on first. How do you handle that? I mean, you have an obligation to survive, if nothing else, because so many people depend on you. But how do you that's handle hard. that pressure? That's a little, that's a little hard because I sometimes forget. 
it's hard, but it's also beautiful. You know, like I've gone through things in life since the book, you know, that have been very hard. Like you and I know, like I went in for elective surgery and I, they really messed up. By the way, that's yeah. a whole different story. And I bled to death and washed myself bleed to death, spraying blood out of me and, and, and you know, the whole experience. And then what that did, the, the trauma surgery that do to save me, save my life and bring me back. And then the recovery, which was, you know, it was just in every way horrendous, you know, like mm. I was, Point enough, you know, I sometimes I like reading esoteric tests and mystical stuff. And I was reading in the Bible, you know, I will put you through the furnaces so you can be cleaned and all this. I was like, hey, that sounds familiar. <laughs> like, you know, like I felt like I went through the furnaces, you know, and, and in those moments, no matter who your audience is and what your responsibility you have, you forget all that. And it just, you just have to reach out within yourself and it comes down to you and you. Um, and I mean, there was times there where I, I wanted to quit. You know, I'm very, I, 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 um, there was a time there when after going through that, where I was like, I don't think it's worth it. I've done my work. I came to this earth. The earth, this earth is better because I was here. I can, I can actually say that. You know, I, I, I've seen the, like these books wouldn't exist if I didn't exist. They are, you know, maybe I've done my work and it's time to leave. I was at that place last year. And, and then you just reach in and you start did, but you know, I eat my own dog food. I, what I write about it. You reach in and no matter what you're like, you start, you start doing the work, you start doing the work, no matter where you are, you start doing the work. Um, the inner work, it's always the inner work, you know, that, that expresses itself to the outer, to the outer self. Um, and in those moments, sometimes you do think, huh, that'd be kind of ironic. The guy who wrote this book, you know, just at some point is like, fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> you know? Well, no, but I mean, yeah, you're very but... candid in the book about the <laughs> thoughts that you've had. And yeah, I mean, I keep thinking about that because I know the trauma that you've endured recently since the book. And the book, by the way, has had many incarnations, not just in physical space, but in, in spiritual space, so to speak. And it, it's affected so many people. But but again, I'm just like, yeah, th this 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 man, he has this capacity, but does he have an infinite capacity? And that's that's I worry for you. I again, I don't know you that well. You don't know me that well. Yeah. But I'm I'm like listening to the book, reading the book again and again, and I keep thinking like, God, I just hope you know a silent prayer. Like I hope you're taking care of yourself, and it's not selfish to do that. And so, mm. again. You know, I, I'm, there's not really much of a question there. It's just more of a of an uh, of an observation that the practice is what saves you, and it seems to keep saving you and coming back. You talk about, you know, this dovetails with what I do, or you know, in some sense as a joke, but like gravity, the importance of gravity, because the gym is actually a very important thing to you as your physical soul and and so forth. Can you talk about that uh, and and kind of the daily practice and coming back to it? Um, first of all, are you still doing it despite all these setbacks and challenges that you've had? Or is it just like, you know, it, it's sometimes no, no, it, you're better no, than no, others? No, no. Yeah. it's like I learn each time you got to do it more. Um, mm. It's the mental work is more important than any other work. Yeah. The inner work. And I say mental, it's more like the heart. But I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll answer these in the, in, the, in the order you were talking about. And you may have to remind me as I go along. <laughs> as, um, the whole thing about I do feel like I had something important to give to the world when I wrote this book, like when I would, especially the second version that came out last year, right? Because now I was like already successful. What do I need to put in here to make it the, and I was like, I'm gonna make it the end all manual. And literally no one's ever done that. Right. Step-by-step -step manual, how to love yourself. Here you go. It's not bubble baths, it's the inner work. You know, which may lead to bubble baths or whatever, but it's the inner work and it's a step-by-step. -step. No one's ever deconstructed it. Every, right. Your mom, your grandmother, everybody tells you to love yourself, but who deconstructs it, right? And so I set out to do that and then you become mission driven because you want to put the very best you can out to the world, especially when a book, you can't unwrite a book. You can't be over someone's shoulder saying, but you know, what I really meant to say in that sentence was X or Y, right? And then I also have a, a, an obsessive commitment to being honest in my words, in a sense, not, not, Hey, read my journal, feel sorry for me. I hate that kind of writing. I hate that kind of conversation. And failure it's porn, more, right? Yeah, yeah, it's more like the lessons. Why am I sharing anything? You know, I shared things about my childhood in that book that my mother doesn't know, and I would really break her heart if she found out, right? But why? Because I had enough emails from readers struggling with it, and and they thought they were alone. So I wrote, shared it to to, to show them one how, one that they're not alone, and second how I overcame it, mm -hmm. so that they realized, look, here's this guy. I'm not some self-help guru. I'm not a self-help writer. I'm a writer who wrote self-help. Right. Big, big difference, by huge, the way. Huge, yeah. Right. Huge difference. And so, and I'm very clear about my failures. So they understand like who I am. 
like I'm the guy who came up with this for myself, but look how I struggle with it. So you mm -hmm. don't think you do this and every, you know, Kamal's perfect. I'm not, so I can't do this. Kamal is far from perfect. Kamal mm -hmm. works on himself. That's the only thing and that anyone can do. Um, so I had this obsessive responsibility to the book. That's where it beca becomes, because this book is my gift to the world. Yeah. It's my, and so like, so going back to that surgery experience, right? When I got out of the hospital, I was in every pain medicine known to man. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in the hospital, I was in IV, narcotics, oral narcotics, the whole works. Like, I mean, drugged up beyond belief, all the opioids they make, right? And this when is, I, by the way, I, for my listeners who might not be familiar, this is someone who didn't drink. I mean, you basically abstain from all sorts of, uh, you know, alcohol. Well, you know, I, I mean, I go through phases. I love wine, you know, yeah, like me, I, me too. Yeah. But, but I'm not, I'm not like, I'm just I, saying to look, go I'm, from like not drinking, you know, maybe you have a glass of Manischewitz every now and then, but, <laughs> but then to have like morphine drips. I mean, that was probably a radical shift to your system. Um, well, I was in such an insane amount of pain, like of course, horrific yeah. pain. No, I don't no, know. No, you can have, yeah, yeah. No, but what's interesting is pain. You don't even realize you can, pain can go that far. It's, yeah. it's like, it's such an abstract concept until you're in it. You just sort of, when, your mind can comprehend that this, something like this is possible. That's right. Um, and so the, the, I'm, thank God for morphine, you know? I know, I know. It's a opioids. godsend, literally. It's a lifesaver. But, I mean, but here's the thing. When they let me out of the hospital, you know, they gave me, like, the doctor was like, look, I'll just re keep on refilling the prescription. I can't give you a massive prescription like we used to in the old days. But if he, literally, I remember this quote, if anyone qualifies for these, it's you, hmm. right? So he gave them to me, and I'm on them. I'm home um, in my place in New York. I was staying in New York. I was in my couch in New York. They just curled up in pain and opioid and opioid days for a week. Right. And the final draft of love yourself was due. This was already in, I got out of the hospital in October. Uh, the book was coming out in first week of January. And so like the final, final, like you can't change a word draft, I think was due in um, sometime in November by then. Mm -hmm. And it's the very latest. And so I had a really good draft until then, but I knew there were things I needed to change. And I'd gone for an electric surgery. I was going to come back and work on it. None of this was expected, hmm. right? So I come out and I start working the draft and I can't, I'm on opioids. My mind's too slippery. And if you read my writing, it's written very simple. And that's the hardest thing to do actually as a writer. So write, it's easier to complicate something. Oh yeah. Now, to break it down to the simple principles using the simplest of the words that a child can understand. Yeah. That's the, where the craft comes in, right? That's right. And so I realized like, while I was doing it, my mind was slippery. Like I was slipping, slipping and sliding around the words and I can't be precise then. So I went cold turkey off the opioids, cold mm -hmm. turkey. Wow. I was like, and cause I was in a deadline and it was my book. It was going out whether, you know, whether I worked in this draft or not, you know, the publisher had their, you know, they have their own schedule, Harper Collins. They have right. a whole schedule, a whole thing. They can't change. That's like a big machinery that's moving. So I went cold turkey and worked on it. And I would just literally just be, sweating i'd be like working on my my computer sweating from the pain trying to get the words precise word by word my last chance to work word by word on this book why you know why did i do that why did i it was like i would end up pain would be too much i would go curl up and just curl up in pain and just like you know i wish I'd, i had i cried because i maybe crying then would have helped mm. just kind of like wrote it wrote the pain through and then got mm. up back to it in front of okay pains i've ridden that wave time to go back to the work went back to the work because I, it was my gift to the world. So that thing about giving it really, at this point, at a certain point, you start working on something and you realize you bring out to the world, this is my gift. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make this gift the damnest best gift I can. And if it takes me writing pain, that's what I'll go through. You know, it was, so in some ways it was a gift to me Yeah. because it gave me something to get up for. It gave me something to work on and something to go off the opioids. You know, one thing I realized uh, about a weekend my mind, I like the opioids. Mm. I started my mind enjoying it. <laughs> and that's, I was like, oh shit, I get <laughs> now the addiction. Yeah. You know, because it's like, you, you know what it is? It's not even they've reduced the pain, they do, but what they do something else, they make you not care about it. Mm. And I was like, it makes perfect sense. If your life, if your life is not going well and you have this thing that makes you stop caring about the pain and gives you something like takes you away and it could be emotional pain, what a beautiful thing. Why wouldn't you get addicted to it? And it makes, I, it's, you can see why these things are so seductive. And that you brings know? me to, to a comment that I noticed from your book. You know, there's an old saying, you know, uh, hatred is not the opposite of love. It's indifference. indifference. So yeah. I, that you just said something. It's like sending shivers up my spine because you're basically saying 
the drugs are not the opposite of like love or like you hate them or it doesn't make you, you know, the opposite of pain. It makes you indifferent to pain, which is the opposite of loving it, right? So which is why it's so addictive. It's, and you talk a lot in this book about but this particular woman. I'm not going to, I don't, I hate it when yeah, authors come yeah. on and the podcast, tells, tell us the entire thesis yeah, of the I books. Yeah, I am like, no, read no, the because, damn book. <laughs> and I'm not even saying it's so like you'll sell more books. You sell millions of copies, but the point is, is that you have to ex, uh, enjoy this experience because I found it very few times with books, Kamal, and this I'm commending you, uh, and you'll know that I do it very rarely. You probably won't find it in any of my podcasts, but the, you ever finish a book and you're like pissed off that you finished it because yeah. you'll never <laughs> experience the thrill of finishing it for the first time. The first time. Yeah. And, and I think yeah. about that with this book, but also how candid you are and how honest you are. But, but I did want to ask you about that. Do you agree that the opposite of like loving yourself would like your life to would it be that you'd be more scared if somebody is indifferent to themselves rather than they hated themselves? Do you agree with that old That's cliche? So interesting. That is so interesting. I never thought of it that way. But I think indifference is when you stop caring about life. Right? When you stop caring about life, that's when the danger is the danger is. Mm. Right? You're jaded. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, when you stop caring about life is when it just slides downhill anyway. You know? So maybe, yeah, you're right. Maybe you're right. Because hatred, I, you can pull it out. You can pull out. You can like get sick of it. Hmm. You know, like that that thing in um, um, what was the classic movie? Gone with the Wind. At the end, she goes, "Scott is my witness. I will never go hungry again." Hmm. You think she'll ever go, ever be hungry after that? <laughs> Maybe one or two days here and there, but she's gonna get out of it. That doesn't come from a place of indifference. That no. comes from a place of no more. That comes from like, okay, let the hatred get to the point where you're just sick of yourself, and say no more, no mas. You know, and as God is my witness, I will get out of this. That, maybe, so maybe, I think you're right. I think indif indifference is the actual, is the devil, not the, not the hatred. Yeah. You know? Right. You can use hatred as sort of a guide or rocket fuel to like yeah, prove to all those people. Yeah, ship around. Right. Yeah. They said I was fat when I was in high school. Yeah, I'll show yeah, them. Yeah. And you're like, ruin yeah. yourself. Um, but but last thing before we leave that the, the book specifically, and I'm going to come up again and again, but, uh, but, but specifically towards this topic of pain and pain avoidance, you know, there's all these economics, you know, studies by Nobel Prize winners that say, you know, humans are loss averse, you know, they don't, they'd rather, you know, not oh, yeah, win, yeah. not win, you know, $10, than you know, possibly l risk losing $1, you know, it's just incredible kind of asymmetry of pain reception. And I wonder if that, you know, maybe ties into this thing about drugs. And, and this is where I part ways with Sam Harris, who we were speaking about before I started recording, uh, you know, who I have a lot of respect for, but, you know, him and, and, and people like, I think you're friends with Tim Ferriss and, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they promote and extol like psychedelics and, 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 and sort of, and I haven't done that much research on it. And, and people ask me about it. And I just say, honestly, I'm not that familiar with it, but I am kind of a, uh, a drug uh, non-use maximalist. In other words, with my kids and I'm blessed to have kids, you know, I really steer them away from it because I think in contradistinction to what I've heard Sam Harris say, that time is not the most precious of all quantities, nor is attention. Like we all have time to watch cat videos. I watch a lot of cat videos, um, but how much attention do we have? We actually don't have, you know, sort of attention you can never get back, time you can never get back, money you can get back. So I agree, money is not the most precious commodity, but I actually yeah, think- funny, right? A money is actually things that once you get that mindset, money is like the easiest thing in the world. And I want to talk to you about wealth <laughs> yeah. and the meaning of wealth and the value of wealth right after this. But but before sure. we do that, I want to say what I think and get your reaction to it, because I know it'll be um, it'll be it'll be you know really valuable for my listeners to hear. And that is, I think innocence is the most precious uh, oh, commodity. Oh God, that's beautiful. I don't think you can oh, get God. innocence back. I think you can get yeah. time back. You can get money yeah. back but you can't get innocence back. And so I want to shield yeah. my kids from drugs. I want to shield them from violence. I want to shield, but I've, I've said this to people, even like world famous neuroscientists and they're like, oh, well then, you know, they're going to grow up and be, uh, and be damaged and be stunted. And I actually said this to, to this uh, podcast, which I don't recommend, you know, to, to most of my listeners to go and tune into my episode called the drinking brothers. And these guys called it me and everybody an effing C word and a seeing F word mm -hmm. and whatever. But, at the end, the guy's like from the 82nd Airborne. I know you were in the army as well. We talked about that. But he the talked- 82nd Airborne, we went to boot camp with him. We both probably went to Benning. Oh yeah, this is Dan Holloway. His name's Dan Holloway. I mean, if, if he was an infantry soldier, at least he went to jump school at Benning. It's funny, you know, just military used to- Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And I said to him, because he was like, no, the most important thing is, and I said, like, I think it's innocence. And and he just stopped, Kamal. He just oh, stopped. So, I saw him get yeah, teared you up. It. You and he goes, it. 
I've, I've been, I've gone overseas. I've, I've taken a man's life. I've had to do it. And I'll never get that back. Even though he might've deserved it or we were in war. And if I didn't take his yeah, life, yeah. he would take my life. And he's done it. And he's like, I can't ever get that back. I can't ever be the man that I was before I took another man's life. And I feel like if he can say that, why can't I say to my kids, look, I, I want you to right. have the first kiss with your wife or your husband. Like, I don't, I don't feel better. Like you talk a lot in this book, Kamal, about relationships with women and, and, and you're very candid and, it, and because of your candor, you're vulnerable. And because of your vulnerability, the words penetrate the soul. But for me, I, I was thinking like, I worry, like, are you ever going to be able to get these women out of your bed? Are you ever going to be like, when you're with, when you have a past history, you lost that innocence. And I wonder like, can you come clean? Do you believe in that kind of redemption? Or is it like a new you, a new life? Is, is it possible to, to redeem ourselves once we, and I count myself among it, lose our innocence? Or is it, is it something you can recapture? That's a hell of a question, man. I'm going to have to think on it because innocence, yeah, you're right. Innocence is magical. Yeah, I, 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 would, I can see as a parent, you never want your kids to lose their innocence. It, it, it's magic. It's literally magic because you can, why not look at the world through filters of magic? Um, <laughs> man, uh, boy, that's, that's, you got me thinking. All right, let's talk about something. Uh, no, equally... no, but that's, okay, that's amazing. That's amazing, yeah. man. You got me thinking and thank you for that. I mean, and there's innocence in many things. Like I've never killed a human being with my hands and I hope I never do. Mm -hmm. There's that kind of innocence I have. And there's other innocence like with, with loyalty in relationships or whatever that I've lost, you know, that wherever it wasn't met. And um, do you get that back? I don't know. I don't think you get it back. Um, yeah, I don't think you get it back. Mm. Um, but then maybe that's part of going through life is maybe losing innocence and things. And then what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, you can't be 100% innocent about everything. You might as well just be in a pod or be in the womb all your life, right? <laughs> It's like, what do you do with that? And you lose innocence in that, lose innocence in this, lose innocence. We've all lost innocence. If you built a business, if you built a company, you've lost your innocence about how human behavior, how people mm -hmm. like money brings out. It's I've actually seen how money brings out. Some of it have evolved in everything in their life, but when money gets involved, that's usually where they've evolved the least, where they will take the biggest, and that's where the ethics will slide. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've lost that innocence, you know, but how do I apply it? I kind of more careful about the people I work with. You know, it's, it's like, um, yeah, so there are different things in life you're going to lose innocence over. It's like, who do we, who do, who do we become? Who do we, how do we choose to live our life through that? Maybe you love through a different lens, not, maybe not an innocent lens anymore, but maybe through a different lens. I don't know. <laughs> That's a hell of a question, man. I usually go, don't get stumped. <laughs> uh, you you really made me think thank you for this what, wow. a, what a gift thank you uh, well i love your work i love your books and actually the one thing i would did want to just call to highlight just to jog your memory because i don't remember everything i wrote but there's a really uh, delicious delightful passage where you talk about suicide mm -hmm. and you talk you literally use the words to get out of this suicidal funk you needed to quote cut a magical new groove in your life. And just as water erodes rock and you needed to let that process of pain become the redemptive force that took you away from this. And so I do think it is a form of magic and innocence is magic, but you know, in physics, that which can be transformed into something else has a symmetry and an exchangeability. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that we don't know these things. It's that we need to be reminded of them. And, and mm. maybe, maybe these business people that screw over, you know, you or whatever, maybe they're also, they have a mission and their mission was to make, make you, I don't want to say naive, but less naive or whatever, just like alert you to the nature of human reality. Because I do think that you are, you're an optimist. I, I see you as this, like, <laughs> yeah. as this, uh, a modern day Buddha, you know, a, a thin Buddha ripped, jacked up, yoked Buddha. Uh, <laughs> Dude, but, I'm so not the Buddha. It's funny though. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's let's turn to lighter topics now. Well, let's uh -huh. go let's go to divorce. No, no, I'm just kidding. Imagine if <laughs> <laughs> not a divorce, a California divorce. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> we invented the California divorce. That's right. That's funny. Uh, so I want to talk about um, you know just in practical steps. Do you feel like the practice is the capital practice? Because, you know, in other words, is this the only practice or, you know, can Brian Keating come up with, you know, enjoy yourself the, like you're, uh, in other words, mm -hmm. is this the one stop shopping or do you envision that it's a framework, a scaffolding onto which I might be able to graft something onto? That actually is my favorite part of re uh, letters from readers is when they tell me how they built on it. 
Yeah. That makes me happy. Because look, this is one man's truth. One man freaking shit out. <laughs> but it's also, who's also an intelligent man who's who's gone and like read texts going back thousands of years on things and realized like there are certain fundamental human truths and he just stumbled upon one as well for himself. And he has the ability to deconstruct and communicate. So he was able to put it out. But it is a truth. It is a fundamental truth. Loving yourself is a fundamental truth that you, once you once you tap into it, it does change things. But is my version the only way? Fuck no. Like, I mean, there's people I'm sure like, like who have been doing this since they were born or like it's natural to them or you can take this and add to it. In fact, I always tell readers like, tell me what you did. Mm. I want to learn from you. You know, like this is one man's experience. Let's make it a collective experience, you know, like build on it. You're absolutely right. But what I, but I, what I do say is do this first before mm -hmm. you branch off, get the foundation right. You'll see that this works and it'll give you the confidence then to build on it with your own life experience. It's so funny that you say that, Come on, because I've been doing this project called, I call it the assayer, uh, which is, uh, so an assayer is an old fashioned, you know, scientist who would be given a piece of gold. Here's this piece of gold, come on. And you wouldn't know if it's gold. And so what you would do is you take a special stone and that stone okay. was called the touchstone. And the uh -huh. touchstone, you'd rub the gold on, it would make a certain mark only if and if it was gold. And, and so the stone itself has no value. The person who's doing it is not rich, but he or she has the power by this inanimate, useless, inexpensive object to make people billionaires, millionaires. And in so doing, he had to have a touchstone, a companion object that we call a scientist calibration. So how do you know you're getting a pound of coffee when you go down to the coffee shop? Well, it's calibrated against some standard. And so I view the practice as outlined in Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It as a type of calibration touchstone. In other words, it has value intrinsically, but it also has value in that it can reveal via comparison additional valuable properties. And so I salute you for that. And I, by the way, I also think that's true of religion. Like if I think if you're if you're you know if you're considering being an atheist or whatever, you should at least compare it to existing religions, if and only if to use it as a touchstone, as a point of comparison on which you should build upon. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I salute that aspect of it. I want to ask you: Do you believe in this saying, "Fake it till you make it"? You, you know, in a different way, um, not in a. It's more like. In a different way, not in the not in the way you see it on Instagram and all that, you know, like or, or on social media. More, it's like you start. I think be it, just start being it. And my, it always comes down to the inner self. It always comes down to working on the inner self. So, like, if you're working on, um, even if it's just like we talked about with money, right, with wealth, I've noticed with myself. If it was just like my attitude about it changes. I, you know, it's like, then, then my relationship to it changes and, the, and my life circumstances with it change. Very interesting enough. Yeah. So in that sense, I think maybe be it. And that's a, okay, that's a very easy quotable thing to say that <laughs> I'm sure will make a great Instagram quote, but then how does one be it? <laughs> right. Right. I, I hate that shit. Like when was the last time someone's uh, inst life was transformed an Instagram quote? You know, like, <laughs> like what? You know, I'm, I'm, it's like, so the, the, it's the, that's what part of the like, by the way, that, that what I outlined for Love Yourself, one can apply for anything because it was about creating the grooves inside, right? You can apply, I mean, I do that. I apply that for other things as well in my life because I learned like, well, it works for this, it'll work for others, right? I looked at it and I see, you know, kind of, um, are you familiar with like neural networks? Like mm -hmm. this, this process. Yeah. So, um, you know, what they do with neural networks is they flash up, you know, to a camera, a billion pictures of dogs, and then hopefully the computer will recognize dogs. And so I kind of feel like part of this message of your book is expose your brain to constant signals of what love sounds like. Maybe not what it is, but the more you can do it, the 10 breaths, the practice, the mirror, if you can do that, you're training this three pound, you know, squishy computer, supercomputer, and the way that it has processing things through its neural network. And so, you know, it's not even what sounds like, it's what it feels like. Mm. You know, we human, we're, we like to think of thinking creatures, we're actually feeling creatures. The, the neurocortex comes in to rationalize what we felt. 
<clears throat> the neocortex, correct me if I'm wrong, was a was the part that evolved a lot, evolved oh, last. Most right? sophisticated. Yep. And we think it's the part that runs the show. It's no, no, no. It's the it's the old part. It's the oldest. It's the we go down to the binary code. You know, go down. That's what's running the show. It's the brainstem. It's the primal self that's running the show. The neocortex is just creating rationality for it. Mm. You know that we're not as advanced as we think we are. <laughs> it's, you know that that's the illusion. And if you become honest with yourself, I'm always, I have this thing about in business um, is that you got to know the rules of the game you're playing. First, you got to be honest with yourself with the game you're playing, then, then know the rules. And that's how you do well, right? And, and be very honest with yourself, not how you want the rules to be, but what the rules of the game are, mm. right? And it's the same thing here. It's like, we like to think we're like these really, we're intelligence and we're rational. rational. We have that word rational, right? We're anything but. A human being is anything but rational. There is no objectivity. There's only subjectivity. And, and it's just the neurocortex is that beautiful layer of illusion. It's that beautiful matrix that, that the, 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 the old stem, you know, the, the old wiring, the, the original, the baked in software is running. And the neurocortex is just creating the rationalization around it. So we <laughs> feel like we're actually, we're smart. Right. So when you realize that, it's like the whole point of this was to actually go to the old wire and to, to, to cut in through the, to the chatter. The nurse cortex is also the monkey mind that creates all the garbage, that creates all the drama, that creates all the, all the drama it comes from the new cortex, right? You go, you cut through it, you go to the feeling part, you cut to the feeling, you satisfy that, you give it what it needs. And then the neural cortex just rationalizes that. I mean, I'm taking the magic out of this, but really, I think that's what it is. No, I agree <laughs> with you. Actually, it resonates deeply, you know, actually physically <clears throat> with the credo of of Judaism, <clears throat> which is uh, which is called the Shema, which means hear or listen, and that you're not. It says like in this prayer that Jews are saying to themselves three times a day, uh, a catechism of sorts, and it says, uh, "Do not." Uh, so you say it with your eyes closed, your hands over your eyes, and you say, listen, and do not follow after your eyes and your heart because they will make you, it actually says prostitute yourself. In other words, you will give up everything for looks or for beauty or for money or for, mm. but mm. you won't like give up as easily for saying something silently or hearing oh, a voice. Yeah. Like that I've never voice been, within. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, the, that, the truth. It's not the head, it's that, that, that voice within, it's that quiet, that quiet voice within. Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's, that's what the truth is. Oh my God. Dude, beautiful. this is this might be my favorite podcast I've done. Like, <laughs> Did you get that? Did you get that, everybody? No, just... <laughs> and I'm saying it in the podcast, so it's on record. You that's know, like, awesome. Yeah. And, and you do a podcast, Curious Kamal. I am a subscriber. I love it. I leave comments and reviews and ratings, and hopefully everyone will do that too. I I, I can't wait to uh, – every episode that comes out is really a little a little tiny ear nugget treat that uh, I look forward to. Um, so I want to talk now, uh, moving into a, a slightly different direction, in uh um actually maybe before we do that so yeah. obviously you are uh you know you're you're very well known in your own right you talked a lot about how your father's influenced you in a certain way and and obviously you influenced your brother as well um i don't want to talk about your brother i don't want to talk about your father i want to know about your mother she must be a very special it's person more and more influence our mother was the influence not our father because yeah our parents separated when we were young and me so too yeah same just, with me right? exactly the same with me and my so older the, brother the influence of the father was more as a lack of father you know or just the memories of the child of father you know mother was all love and all sacrifice and in some ways that was good some way that was also i can also see where it went where how it affected me in ways that have not been good for me in my as an adult Mm. right because i start to i because she literally like raised my brother and I nothing we were not poor we were poor yeah like we were homeless at one point you know and the rest was just her working minimum wage gone all day you know working one job two jobs my brother and i my brother and i grew up in libraries you know which to our credit made us who we are yeah exactly you know <laughs> um right. i remember one summer i read i counted like i was i kind of read something like two over 250 books <laughs> it was like i was on a mission you know like that i just go to the library because that's that was our, that was childcare, you know, like, uh, and so all I did was read. And then it was, um, as this is as a young kid, um, but what, but love, we had love from her and she, she was there, you know, what, in what way she could and the situation she was thrown into and there's no, no support network, nothing all alone in a city with two boys, two very independent, very thinking boys. Right. Um, and I was a pain in the ass. I was 
I was, my brother was much better. My brother was the good one. I was the pain in the ass. I was, I was literally, I fully admit, I've apologized to her many times. I was the pain in the ass. Um, and, and, you know, so like you, you, but it's like, so, so it was sacrifice and love. And I, and what I've learned, what I've realized is I kind of wired in, in my head, the love, the love equals sacrifice. And what I've learned is, uh, dude, that's not served you. You know, love does not have to equal sacrifice always, you know, where I will give up everything for love and I give myself up for love. And it's like, no, you deserve, you deserve love without having to sacrifice yourself, you know, but it was like, it was, it's very interesting. Our parents, what they give us is beautiful, but we also carry, we can also, we also carry the, the, the other part with it. And that's part of adult is like, maybe letting go of my innocence and letting go of my innocence of that. And that's a good thing. That's a good innocence to go give up. That love doesn't have to be sacrificed. Love can just be receiving because I'm just awesome. Why not that? Why do I have to sacrifice to earn love? You know, or why does love have to be sacrificed? No, that's beautiful, man. And I, I feel, you know, again, you don't know me. I don't know you all that well, but but I feel like I know you. So there's asymmetric knowledge. But same with me. My father abandoned me when I was a young kid. My older brother and I were left to be raised by my, my mother. <clears throat> and she had the same thing, working minimum wage, supporting two kids in the 70s. It was not super easy. And, you know, she she bore the scars of that and a painful uh, divorce and, and so forth. But I always say I'm thankful to my father. I actually reconciled with my father. I, I if I recall correctly, you never really did with your dad, but no, that's another topic for a different day. But with my dad, you know, I felt like, you know what, a weatherman, you know, it's the worst thing. So if you have a weatherman and he's always wrong, that's not so bad because you just do the opposite of what he says. You know, you put, you bring an umbrella when he says it'll be sunny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I felt yeah. like that's what my dad was. <laughs> so I could like, just do the opposite of what he does and I'll be a good dad. And I've heard a kind of joke said by uh, a psychiatrist that I'm friends with in a UCLA named Dr. Stephen Marmer. And he says, your job as a father is pass along half of your neuroses to your kids. <laughs> huh. If we all do that, Why it'll- that? It'll titrate. It'll pipette. You know, because it's, it's much better to pass on half of them than all of them. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I thought it said like almost like you have to pass on. No, no, no. Like, no. Right, okay. If you're neurotic, I mean, I, I, I hear it. that. I hear that some Jews are neurotic. I, I don't know for <laughs> sure, but. <laughs> Man, I've been told living, there's... having spent time in New York, I've learned that that, that stereotype really does hold. You know, uh, like it's it's almost. I have friends of mine who are Jewish. I'm just like, why? Like, uh, you, you have to explain this. It's really fascinating. But you know, the book of the but the culture and then also yeah. the history. I mean, some of it is like, yeah, you can understand. You can yeah. genuinely understand when you like you grow up with grandparents who were always ready to flee. Yeah, you know, so you kind of under you kind of get where this comes from. That's right. It's like people say, "Why are there so many Jewish violin players?" I'm like, because when people are coming after you with a pitchfork, you could carry a violin better than a piano. Uh, <laughs> so I want to talk about uh, about a different subject now. We're going to pivot radically. So those of you uh -huh. listening out there on iTunes or watching us on YouTube, wherever you may be, we're going to pivot radically because I think you're also a teacher when it comes to new technology, and in particular, what I want to talk to you about is is a blockchain and Bitcoin and all sorts of things. But before I do that. Kamal, mm -hmm. I want to ask you, um, from a perspective of wealth, like what is it? What is the value of wealth? I've talked to many billionaires. I've been very blessed and fortunate to know a bunch of them, and I've been blessed to know people that are abject paupers. <laughs> I'm not saying mm -hmm. because they're a billionaire, they're a good, person, but I've had people, you know, extol the virtues of wealth in surprising ways on this podcast. I've had about four different billionaires. I don't know. Maybe you're a billionaire. Maybe you're the fifth billionaire. Uh, but I want to ask you, Kamal philosophically, what is the purpose of wealth to you? You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> this, this, <clears throat> this guy I've been working with uh, recently and doing some deals I'm doing. And uh, he called me up last week and he was struggling. He's like, I got to ask you that. He's 22. He's like, I'm rich now. <laughs> and I got rich in, in crypto. But I didn't feel like I got rich by pushing paper. He's like, how did you deal with it when you first got rich? Like, how do you deal with big, you know, getting rich? And like, what do you do? What happens then? I was like, first of all, dude, the word rich is a very, very interesting word. It's not, there's nothing objective about that word. It's a very subjective word because you can be around a crew today. I was like, look, you, you could have a 10th of the money you have, go hang out in Bombay. You will feel real at the slums of Bombay. You will feel really rich. All right. right? Or you can hang out with some of the crypto crew and you could feel poor you yeah. know, with the money you have now. It's a very subjective thing. So it comes down to feeling. 
do you feel it? Right. It comes out of feeling. It's a satisfaction. It's like, first of all, do you feel it? Because otherwise, if you do it around who you're surrounded by, there will always be people richer than you and always be people poorer than you. And that's a lesson I had to learn because I used to, you know, I come from the startup world where there's stupid levels of wealth. You're free of friends. A year later, they're, they're like crashing Ferraris and, you know, when, in that they don't even care about and walking away. They almost run your, I've had this happen with like, with a friend, like almost ran me over this Ferrari, but a year before he was driving a Toyota Corolla, you know, like, like, I mean, it's just like that level of things happen. Right. And, and you realize, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a subjective thing. It's a, it's a moving target, especially the, the, the groups you hang out in. So um, what is, go back to the question. What was the question? What, what is wealth? What do you see as the purpose of wealth for you personally? Okay, that's a better question. I give you a shitty answer. I'll give you a better answer to your better question. Um, the purpose to me of wealth, and for me, it's always been, it's been a moving target too. Maybe that's where I was getting at, you mm-hmm. know, where I felt, you know, I did well and I didn't feel rich, you know, where like now I'm, I'm doing well and I'm feeling rich. Uh, what's the difference? Now, what is the purpose of it? Purpose of it is just, it gives you, it comes down to feeling, gives you a feeling of, I can do whatever I want. I don't have to worry for what I want, you know, because then at a certain point you get, it's just shinier things. What can I get? I can get something shinier. Or if it's if you're into buying planes, I can get a plane with more seats. That's all that happens. That's the only difference. But does that change you? I hope not. Because if it does, you were damaged in ways that like, you know, like. Yeah, money's not going to help, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what every time you get a more seat, you feel, you know, it's like, that's not it. So I think it gives you a sense of, um, I'm okay. It's hmm. weird. It gives you a sense. I'm okay. I can, whatever, like I can, it, you don't, you know, the, the, I've been in a position in my life where I have to worry about money and I'm in a position in my life where I don't have to worry about money. Let me tell you, it's much better than a position where you don't have to worry about money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Cause yeah. it is a worry. Right. But the funny thing is rich people worry about money. Yeah. You know, you know how many rich people you and I know that all they do is sit there worrying about their taxes. Yeah. They worry more about money than someone who's poor. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm talking That's about, right? right? Yeah. Like, Absolutely. like their mindset, if you go into their head, it's a shit show about taxes, about how they're trying to cut taxes and this or that, doing trust, doing that, whatever, versus someone who's just trying to pay the bills. Mm. They worry less about money. <laughs> it's funny because almost everyone I've interviewed started off poor or not wealthy and they became billionaires. And I think those types of people have a different approach to wealth in that it is a tool. It's a, a, And like tools in physics, a tool is something that can convert energy to useful work. In other words, you can do something with it. All of them give back. All of them are mm-hmm. philanthropic. All of mm-hmm. them see it as a tool and not part of who they are. Yes, they enjoy the trappings of it. They enjoy their boats and their, you know, it's funny because I thought of two different quotes from the movie Wall Street that I used on this guy, uh, Peter Schiff and Michael Saylor, two different sides of the Bitcoin coin. And uh, and one of them I said to uh, to Peter Schiff, you know, Charlie Sheen says to, to Michael Douglas, he goes, you know, why are you making all this money? can only water ski behind one yacht at a time. And, and the other guy, and the other time he says a good quote. So it's, that's true. It's like, you can't have two yachts and like one, at one, uh, maybe you could with with your rings, you know, you're doing the (laughs) ring workout. You could do two. But, uh, but the other thing he says, like, ah, he tells his girlfriend, Daryl, and he's like, oh, I'm just saving up. Like, I'm just living the, for the dream of one day I'll be able to ride a motorcycle across China. And I'm like, you know, that costs like 800 bucks. Like yeah, you could do yeah, that yeah. now. Like yeah, anybody yeah, could do that yeah, pretty much if yeah. they wanted to. So I see it as, as yes, wealth, yeah, of course, you know, having had some, you know, poverty, extreme poverty in my life and then, and more, obviously it's easier. It gives you options. It gives you, as you're saying, it's a tool for what I say is risk management. It's like, it allows you to hedge. It allows you to take precautions. It allows you to prepare. But fundamentally, my goal has always been, you know, bounce the check to the undertaker. Because if you die yeah. with wealth, I kind of see these people that die with like millions, even the woman in New York City who died and she left $80 million to the New York Public Library or whatever. It's like, you know how good she could have treated people during her life? Like there are people uh, starving and like- That's a great point. You know, it's like, use that before you die, like guy was zero. I had the author of that book. He's African, one of the first African American like hedge fund pioneers and leaders, Bill Perkins. He was on the show. He actually called in this guy Dan Bilzerian. He's they're on a yacht together. I know, I know of Dan. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah know, he's like I a crazy guy. Yeah, I don't know. I know his cousin. His cousin and I are friends on our Twitter friends. Uh, but that brings me out, yeah, to this point. And and I think it's it's it has a tool. It has a purpose. 
but um, and certainly, you know, more is better in a certain sense. But but you know, you look at the the extreme inequalities that there are in the world, and I just wonder, you know, does that does that have an effect on you? Because also in Judaism, by the way, it's you're, you have to give ten percent of your income away every. You have to. It's a law, but you cannot give more than twenty percent away every year. In other words, there's a cap on how much you can get. And that's after taxes, by the way. So it's taxes plus 10%, a maximum of 20%. So you could give away like 80% of your, of your income. But anyway, that's because at a certain level, people that are doing charity might become convinced of their own godliness. In other words, that this oh, hospital great. you know, that's that I'm looking great. at at UCSD has a guy's <clears> name <throat> on it. It has Erwin Jacobs, the founder of Qualcomm. So, you know, and I'm looking at it, I'm like, I'm glad he donated that rather than you know, bought another baseball team or something. But at the same token, it's like, you know, he's not God. And, and there is a value to wealth. And I think the goal should be to die with zero as, as Bill Perkins' book. I want to ask you, um, now we're going to switch to actually a cryptocurrency and its purpose. Another quote from Judaism is, uh, anyone who is more religious than me is a religious zealot and a fanatic, and I should not be like him. And anyone who's less religious than me is an idolater, is, a, is an idol worshiper, is a loser oh. and a fraud. So I feel this way about Bitcoiners versus Ethereum. Oh, people. God. In other it's words, religion. It's worse than religion. It's a religion. Man. So Don't let's give these people guns. Let's talk <laughs> about it. Let's talk about it. I feel what like I'm know? so sucked down the rabbit hole now. Like people are, it's funny because I'll interview somebody about gold and then the Bitcoin guys will say, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a gold bug. And then I interview the gold bug and they say, I'm, and he calls me a Bitcoin shill. You know, it's like, anyway, why is it so religiously overtoned? Why does it have these implications of, implications of, of zealotry associated with it? What is it about this, this humble money. little mathematical it's a, level, it's, it's a, it's a level of money involved that, that has that also control and that's what we talk about business man people's like least evolved version comes out hmm. you know you can you see that at least when shit hits the fan you can see that so you can really get to know a person when shit hits the fan what the values are that's, right. that's you know, really that's how i've learned people's real values right um they can be great until shit hits the fan and then you see ah oh, okay that's what you're made of because they may actually be who you think they are but sometimes you know so there's one very important lesson i learned was you know, like uh, there's a there's a classic there's a Zen story uh, about a scorpion that asks a monk for for to, they're they're at a river bank, and he actually he's and, and the monk is about to swim to the other bank, and the scorpion says to the monk, uh, "Could you give me a ride to the to the other side?" And the monk says, "No, you're a scorpion. You'll sting me." And the scorpion goes, "Well, no, because then look, we'll both die." You know, mutually assured destruction, right? So, like, so, like, just take this monk's like, okay, that makes sense. You know, do no harm has to has to help life. So, hop on my back. You know, they go across halfway across the way, stings the scorpion, and he goes, "What the hell?" And he's drowning, he's dying. He's a scorpion. Goes, "I'm a scorpion." You know, that's what they do. That's one thing you also learn about people, right? And and business is like you can't hold it, you can't take it personally when you when you stop doing that. And that's that's the thing about. Remember when I talked about rules of the game? And I've learned about crypto. There's rules in that game, and they're all emotional rules. They're human rules. They're not rules of, of the blockchain, right? So when it comes to all this, you look at what are these people's incentives. What are their emotional need that they're feeling that they really need to take a stand? You know, often people do that with a, a movement of any sort, and the crypto is just the same thing. But at the at the heart of it, most of them are not being honest with themselves, which I don't like. In the end, it's money. They wouldn't be doing this if they didn't stand to make money off this. If this was purely just change the world, well, go work in an NGO in Africa. You want to change the world. You know, really want to do something practical. You know, there's plenty of billions of opportunities, things you can do to change the world, right? Why choose the, the blockchain, which for most projects don't even need a token. Let's be really honest, right? Let's, I'm not talking about, um, right? But that's not the rules of the game. The rules of the game are because there's money involved and people can get rich really fast, really. And there's a lot of unethical players. Crypto is full of, uh, crypto brings out, the most level of unethical is, first of all, it's global. And anyone can hop in. And it's a get-rich-quick scheme for a lot of people. What's, what do you think that's going to bring? You know, all the people in MLM, all the shady people in the internet, they're, they're all in it, right? Plus good players. There's a lot of good actors. Oh, yeah. People actually believe in it. Like a lot of people who are they, they're creating, they feel like they're really creating the next thing for, they're creating the, the evolution of the internet. It's like we get to be part of creating the next thing that brings people together, that creates power for the individual, right? There's also the philosophy. But honestly, I'll be honest to say that that's a minority, a fraction of a, like a small, small fraction compared to the rest. The rest are in it to get rich. Yeah. And get rich fast. And you see and all the most, whole, a lot of the scams. 
all the hallmarks of religion. Look, there's uh, there's like the you know this this founding origin story. There's which this... is great. They, they, I know. I mean, if it was a virgin, they needed a virgin. They need a virgin involved. Like if they had a virgin, it would have been perfect. You got <laughs> Satoshi, which who may or may not exist. You've it's got such uh, a great origin story. You can have priest, as a writer, like... man, as a sci-fi writer. Like this would have been such a great story. If you were I know. A it's book. so perfect. And then and then you just have people like just banding terms around and like you know thermodynamics of money and i you know whatever i I find it kind of funny and and enjoyable because it's like i talk from a physics perspective and then you know they think that oh well i know the you know i've heard of the second law of thermodynamics you know so that makes me a physicist and now i can say all these big words like entropy and and uh, gay you know whatever but but i find like the 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 vehemence from the you know against the apostates so there are apostates just like in a religion you have to have apostates you can't have religion there's sacrifices there's you know there's uh all, all sorts of these these characters characteristics of religion and as i always say you know the nobel prize is a type of religion it's centered on a you know three inch golden graven image with a picture of its founding father alfred nobel and these are scientists that are bending down to the worship of dynamite <laughs> yeah exactly uh financial dynamite is uh you know but yeah so i actually want to ask you about these the non-bitcoin aspects uh, because i actually think there could be some applications. So as James Altucher always recommends to us, we should always have ideas and those ideas should have sex and then you produce new ideas. And so one of my ideas is like, let's take blockchain, which is really cool as a cool idea and science and inventions and discoveries, which is another kind of cool. And let's put them together. So how would that work? Well, let's say I make a big discovery. I discover a unified theory of gravity and quantum mechanics, which you and I are studying together, correspondence style via text mm-hmm. message and it. clubhouse. I love it. That's, oh, I'm going to get you your PhD, Kamal. You, you mark, James didn't think he could get his PhD. He's getting it in cosmology. You're going to get it in quantum mechanics. But Let's say I've got the Holy Grail. It eluded Albert Einstein, who tried for you know the last 10 years of his life unsuccessfully to come up with a unified field theory uniting the laws of quantum mechanics and the very small with the laws of gravity and the very large. He failed, but I have come up with the idea or, or somebody else, but I'm, I haven't worked out all the details, but I don't want you, Kamal, after I've schooled you and taught you so much stuff about quantum, to come and scoop me because then you'll win the Nobel Prize that I should likely, so I'll have a second, I'll have to write another book, Losing the Nobel Prize Part Two. So I think one interesting thing would be like put it in a blockchain somewhere, put the discovery somewhere out there and, uh, and then use that later on to show like, actually I had to work out a couple of extra details, but I had the right idea and I have proof of stake, you know, that I actually had the stakes out first because science you may not realize is actually extremely competitive, as competitive as any fortune 500 or takeover or VC because there's millions of companies, right? But there's only one Mm -hmm. Nobel prize. And so it's a conserved monopoly. So I want to ask you, like, do you see other, uh, uh, you know, kind of beyond the like artwork or whatever? I mean, I can get, I can talk. I, I don't think it's heretical the way that the Bitcoin maximalists think to talk about NFT. But do you see a role for it, maybe in science or inventions or patents or things like that? Or that's where blockchain gets really interesting, right? Um, because look, in the in the past. We needed a middleman. We needed some sort of scroll or scribe we went to and said, write down this record that, that now it's official. I, I paid you, you, you were the scribe, you were the notary. You know, like uh, uh, Da Vinci's uh, father was a notary. He came from a long line of notaries, right? And I was right. reading his biography. And turns out they were like really valued, respected, upper class because they were the notaries. They were the middlemen who said, the I'm putting the stamp. Right. They, the were the they were the assayers. Right? They were the assayers. Yep. But more than that, they were just, they were not, even, they were more like, they didn't create anything. Right. right. They were just like, I'm putting the seal that, and it's a legit, I'm the scribe, I'm putting the seal. And so this is legit. Right. So that was the, that's been all of human history. You know, you had to do that. But what blockchain makes really interesting is the fact that you don't need that. The entire community, the, the, the humanity, anyone running a computer or a phone is a fraction of that. We all become that together, we become a piece of it. That's what makes it really interesting. That truly is the decent, it becomes the internet of anything. You know, like I think my brother actually said, they used to call Bitcoin the internet of money, hmm. right? Which is really smart. And I think the smartest thing that, that was done with crypto was attach it to money because then everyone wants a piece of it. Mm. You know, you get money involved, right? Mm-hmm. So. But there, that doesn't stop there. You can you can use this technology, which is permissionless. You don't need someone's permission, which is trustless. You don't need to trust a middleman. You know, you don't need, it's immutable. You don't need to like, you know, if you do the blockchains right, it's like someone can't 
change it, you know, sneak it at night, pull out that piece of paper, put it in their piece of paper, and now there goes your proof or steal it. It's gone. You know, you don't need a safety deposit box, right? So it does that. So now you can, it's basically like the perfect record keeping system. And a record can be a contract, a record can be a financial transaction, a record can be you and I talking, you know, it's so, it's, that's going to be interesting to see where this goes. And that, that's purely up to just uh, the imagination of the human being. So that means you can get, this, can go, this can go anywhere. Including, and I think you're absolutely right, as far as scientific discovery. And also, why shouldn't scientists, I think you and I have talked about this, you, it was, you came from you, why shouldn't scientists share the spoils of the discovery? Because right now, what are the best generations of our mind doing? There are Google creating a, a, a way to get you to click on more ads, or there are hedge funds trying to figure out that extra fraction of a thing that they can screw over someone else because it, stock is a binary game. Someone has to lose for you to win. It's not... Yeah. It's not the kind of games I like to play. I like to play the games where, like, you you win, everyone else involved wins, right? The but infinite in game, Street, not the zero sum, not yeah. the zero sum game. Wall right? Street. So that's why they have the quants, right? How yep. can I make the other person lose so I win? Like, someone's got to sell me at a cheaper price so I buy at a higher price, right? So, um, you know, the best generation, but best minds of a generation are taken up by clicking on ads or screwing someone over so you can make a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a penny a piece of stock times a bazillion, right? That's the best. That's the best. Gener- so the economic money, economic incentives. But what if that person was doing research and that research they were able to put out in a way that's that's like then you could attach to things that anything that comes out of it and they get a percentage of financial gain. Yes. What would that be worth? You would you would have in the people creating world class research and becoming rich because of it. That would be amazing, and that's how it should be. Imagine if scientists started getting rich. And no one's ever done that. No one's ever had like a VC fund for scientists. You've had people that do, you know, donations. Because yeah, you can't monetize. You have to have a mon- you have to have a payout at the end. Uh, otherwise, it beca- that's why it's a VC fund. The point of VC fund. People ask me, "What's your thesis on your VC fund?" It's return on capital. I'll yeah. be honest. That's the rules of the game. I have LPs who put money in my fund because they want me to return significantly on capital. Right, and I deliver. Right. Now, if you create a way, an economic system that rewards, that creates an outsized out- outcome, and also a VC funds, you get an outsized outcome. Like I, I passed on a deal um, a couple of weeks ago, which probably would have been a 10x. Hmm. You know, for every dollar you put in, you get $10 yeah. back. I passed on it because hmm. for the kind of work I do, I want like 100x or 1,000x. Right. Wow. So that's the kind of, if you, but what's the scientific discovery work for? What was calculus worth? You know, yeah, like, exactly. Like, I mean, like, like, what is the, you, you know, what is like a new theorem that combines things or whatever that lets you have all of a sudden have faster laser, or right. a laser that can be done with like one tenth the cost, or a new kind of laser, yeah. right? Yeah. What is that worth? Now, if you can tie that to a system that's recognized and say like this person, and then, uh, but you got to get other. The problem is this doesn't just exist in some blockchain universe by itself. You have to time the real world part. You're trying the economic incentives. You have to get players involved. You have to get universities involved if they license it. You know, because normally universities get the, from the patents, right? right? Or it could be, but if someone was to create that, I think you could create a whole renaissance and discovery. Because now all of a sudden, all the greatest minds are that 16-year-old kid in his garage who's trying to figure shit out and, and does figure something and puts it on there rather than go work at Google and get make you click on ads one every, one every 100 time extra. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. And the, the incentives are that you create yeah. the monetary expense, incentive and we could literally transform like the pace of acceleration, you know? I actually think the first step is awareness because what's happened is, you know, so the uh, physics community invented uh, invented the hypertext protocol that is the backbone of the World Wide Web. That was done, at, you know, Tim Berners-Lee was working at CERN, mm-hmm. the particle accelerator. The transistor was invented by physicists. The laser was invented for, and these are trillion dollar contributors to the world economy. So, you know, email and semiconductor instructions and, and anything that uses a laser and the global positioning system and even your cell phone was invented you know the only modern invention which isn't really like you know like social networks those weren't like started by physicists but the underlying architecture of the internet was but cell phones certainly were uh, they were came out of bell laboratories the same place that made the first transistor so my feeling is that first we need to start with education because imagine all these scientists died basically penniless you know that's Einstein- what I would say, not the not the ones at CERN because they're working for a company and the company had and and some is rightfully so they're paying the salaries 
Yeah. And they're paying them to work. They're paying them, and the output is intellectual property. And right. So you know that. So that goes to the company. Kind of makes sense. And they should actually, but they should get a percentage of it. Right. But in education, the ones who are starving, how do you drive those scientists to go work in education? Right. To actually work in a lab rather than work in in a corporate lab. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's like prestige, that's influence, that's, and you know, you see nowadays it's just like, oh, well, you know, Kim Kardashian will have a billion followers and and so forth. Uh, although, you know, you only follow one person on all of Twitter, and I'll yeah. leave it to the to the reader or the listener to go and find out why. But I'll, I can always happily explain why. Okay, you know, yeah, let's do. Where is the Rock? I I, I know, but I tell the Rock. Tell me, tell... look, I'm such a fan of the Rock, and for not the reasons people think. I never watch uh, i don't watch uh, wrestling i've never seen him wrestle you know i enjoy his movies i like the roles that he plays he's very like he plays a lot of fun roles right but uh it's because of who he is he he is he has a commitment to excellence in his life that is just so rare that i just really admire that and he lives it and he's also he always gives back he's friendly he's great to his fans he's great he's always yeah. very, given who he where he where he's reached in society he is incredibly humble Incredibly yeah. gracious, you know, consistently, including I, I know people have met him. They all say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so like I, so for me, like that's a person like I would, that's the kind of people I, if I'm to admire people, that's who I admire. Yeah. yeah. So that's our father rock. Yeah. So Kamal, uh, I have a birthday party for a little girl that I have to go to in a few minutes. And I, I just want to thank you, Kamal, for being so gracious with your time, with your mind, with your spirit, this gift that you gave to the world called Love Yourself Like uh, Your Life Dependent on It, your other books, which we'll put up also in the uh, in the show notes. And again, I just want to wish you blessings and uh, Godspeed. And then I want to also fortify you because the road ahead is going to be challenging challenging, replete with uh, things like strange languages, like Soka Toa, and, and other things that you will encounter on my way to impressing upon you and learning from you, perhaps, the nature of true reality, the nature of the observer. And I just can't wait to see where your adventure story goes from here, Kamal. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And I'll tell you one quick thing. Is yeah. I, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was you know, studying trigonometry yesterday, thanks to you. And I was like, shit, I'm enjoying this. I didn't enjoy math at all in, in high school or college. It was a chore. You did because you had to, to go pass a class. I was doing it to pass a class. Right. And I'm doing it purely out of curiosity now. So like learning about the, you know, the Soka Toa, which immediately came back, but just yeah. to, but now out of curiosity, it's, it's math is a delight. It's it really is. interesting. Like what a gift you've given me. So thank you. As Richard what a Feynman lesson said, in there too. yeah, as Richard Feynman said, calculus is the language that God speaks. And, and I do want you to know that you're in good hands. I'm a doctor. I am, <laughs> I am, I'm not going to prescribe, you know, oxycodone to you. No, you have other doctors that can do that. But I want, <laughs> I want to say uh, that I am cultivating and curating the experience that I would cultivate for my child or whatever, as we go into the impossible and learn about quantum mechanics. So I'm looking forward to gift. these explorations. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. All right, my brother. I got to go put on a party hat and eat some All cupcakes. Right. It's great talking to you, man. Daughter. We'll talk to you All soon. Right. Thank Bye. you. An insufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. 